um, go through 1 Samuel 6 through 8, a little bit of review where we have been really kind of throughout this book. Um, you know, going from Joshua, starting with the conquest of Canaan, the conquering of that, and then the allotment of the promised land. You remember there at the beginning of that book and then at the end, right? Beginning of the book whenever God um, tells Joshua what he needs to do and that he would be with them through this conquest and conquering. What was one of the things that God stated to Joshua? What does he need to make sure that he's doing? He's about to go through and go conquer all this. So should he focus on war or what's he saying he needs to focus on? Yeah, meditate on the word, right? The book of the law. Make sure that you read it, study it, meditate upon it. And then he gets to the, if we get to the end of that book, Joshua has led the conquest of Canaan. And then in his final farewell speeches, what does he tell both the leaders of Israel and then the children of Israel in the final two chapters? Well, they need to make sure they're doing Yeah, choose who you're going to serve, right? Don't serve these other gods. One of the things that he tells them is what do they need to make sure that they're doing? Following God, choosing to serve God, doing what God says, right? Following the book of the law, doing what God's told them and commanded them to do. And so there's a reason why I say that, because we're going to bring that back out as we go throughout this lesson once again uh, today. So we see that, and then we get to Judges, and what do we have constantly happening throughout Judges? Right, kind of like a cycle there. Uh, you can see it as either a circle graph or, uh, like we said, almost like a wave where you had faithfulness and obedience occurring, but then they would rebel against God. You have a generation that would rebel against God, and so there'd be uh, one that was sent in to oppress them, and then they would repent, cry out to God. God would send a deliverer, and then they would come back to faithfulness, but then they'd go back to it again, right? That cycle happened time and time again. We get into Samuel, and has that cycle really changed? No, we're, we're seeing that same type of thing, right? Uh, and we've gone through Samuel 1 through 5, uh, seeing that Samuel's born, uh, that uh, he goes and works with Eli. The last time, one of the things we talked about is the fact that the Ark of God is taken by the Philistine, uh, Philistines, rather, and Eli dies. Now, in that, we need to talk about chapter 5 because it really leads into chapter 6. The Ark of God was taken by the Philistines. What had happened? That's right, yeah. They remember, they took it to war with them. So they took it from um, they took it from Shiloh, and i got a map, and I'll point that out here in a minute. From Shiloh, where it was within the tabernacle, right? They thought, hey, we're at this battle with the Philistines. Uh, they've already been defeated, right? They've, they've already gone to battle and lost uh, battles. And so they said, well, let's bring in the ark, and then we're going to arouse everybody, and God is with us, and therefore we're going to go through and we're going to win. Well, what happens? They get destroyed, right? And then the Ark of God is taken. Now, we also get into 1 Samuel 5. That's where the Ark of God is now in Philistine. Uh, it's, it's in Phil the control of the Philistines. They take it. And what are they doing with it? That's right, right? Remember, they put it in Dagon's house, and that doesn't work out for them. What happens to Dagon? Falls down, bows, perform, right? They put it back up, and then he falls down, and he's crushed, right? Everything like that. Not only that, so then they move it to somewhere else, and what happens then? Yeah, plagues, different things happening, right? And so all this continues on. That leads us then into chapter 6, okay? Because chapter 6 is really a continuation of that. Overview of what we're going to be looking at today. The ark, because of what uh, was occurring, is now going to be returned by the Philistines, and we'll look at that in 6. 1 Samuel 7, Israel returns to God. And uh, they defeat the Philistines at Mizpah in the first Samuel 8. We're going to get into uh, Israel wanting a king, requesting a king. And the next time we'll start into chapter 9 where they talk about um, a king being appointed and everything like that. So first Samuel chapter 6. Here was the map that I was talking about. Remember, right? It was here at Shiloh. That's where the ark was uh, in the tabernacle. They bring it here. To the battle with the Philistines, it is taken, and here's kind of the path that it goes on. And we did look at this map last time with Harry. So at this point in time, as we get into chapter 6, where is it currently at? Yep. 
Okay, you might not know. I mean, that, that, that's where, it's, uh, where, where we have it here on the map. So who's control? I want to ask it like that. Who is in control of it? Philistines. The Philistines have it, right? And all this stuff that we just talked about, it happened to them. So then what is decided in chapter 6? What do the Philistines decide? What are we going to do about this thing? Because it keeps, no matter where we put it, it keeps causing problems within our cities, right? Dagon and uh, not only with Dagon, but then the plagues and different things that are going on everywhere it goes. And as was pointed out last time, what's the point behind that, right? Because with, with, with these polytheistic uh, religions and all these different beliefs that are out there at this time in, in ancient history, what is the belief about Dagon that they confused about the Ark of God. They thought that that was the power, right? The the uh, idol. Is the Ark the power? No, it's the power that's behind it, right? And so they're, they're, they're recognizing this through this time. And they're like, hey, we need to get this thing completely out of here because we've really messed up with the God of Israel, right? So they come together. And I believe it was Foster that pointed it out. Who do they call? Their priest. Right? They call their priest. What are we going to do? What do their priests say to do? Okay, very good. So they're going to put together these offerings, right? This, this, this trespass offering. Right? And not only are they going to do that, first of all, what, what was a part of that offering? What, what all did they put in there? Five golden tumors, five golden rats, right? And they put it in this box, and they put this box next to the tabernacle, or sorry, next to the Ark of God, and what do they put that on? A cart. And what do they have the cart hold by? Yep, two milk cows. Very good. So, and what did they tell the people that they need to do? Let it go. And if it goes back into its territory, then what do we know? God was behind this, right? God Israel was behind this. But if it goes elsewhere, right, it stays in our territory, it doesn't go back into its territory, then it was essentially, yeah, by chance, right, a common chance he's saying this happening. Clearly, uh, as you go through this, where where does the ark go? Best Shemesh. It goes to Beth Shemesh. And so where does it where is it going then? It's going back to Israel, right? So as it goes back in Israel, and you also have along with that the, uh, they, they had, um, some of the Philistines believe it was five lords, but there, there were some that followed it. They saw what happened, right? And then they go back. The ark goes to Beth Shemesh. What happens when it gets to Beth Shemesh? And here, I forgot to click on that. Sorry. It was the picture of what it maybe would have looked like. But the cart, uh, the ark, and then the box of uh, trespass offerings along with it. Okay. What happens when it gets to Beth Shemesh? Say that again. And people are excited about it, right? Those that are in Beth Shemesh are excited about it. Who do they call for? All right, very good. So they call for the Levites. The Levites come. And what do they do with the cart and the cows? All right, they cut the cart up, use the wood as the fire, and then sacrifice the cows. Okay? So that happens. It is in Israelite control now, if you will. But the people of Beth Shemesh, what did they do? There was a problem. They looked inside it. What happened after they looked inside it? 50,000 and 70, right? A lot of people die as a result. So after they die, what do they do? Right? Or after, after that happens, they recognize what's going on. What, what's their position at that point in time? We're going to send this thing over, right? Who who's worthy to to have this? All those types of things. All those types of things. So who do they call for? Yeah, Kirjath Jerem, and then that really is kind of the st- end of six, end of seven. There at the beginning, Kirjath Jerem comes and gets it, takes it. Where do they take it to? It's obviously in Kirjath Jerem, but where do they take it to and place it? House of Abinadab. Right, and who oversees it? Who do they have? Who do they consecrate to be one that kind of watches over it, if you will? Eliezer, right? Abinadab's son. And how long is it there? Twenty years. 
I just went through that whole account, right? And we see just kind of what happened. A lot of it is, a, hey, this is what the Philistines did. But there is, this is what happened when he gets into Israel. What do we recognize is still a problem in Israel? Something that we saw repeated as far as a statement in Judges and something that God told them to make sure they weren't doing in Joshua. Worshiping other gods. Worshiping other gods. Okay, that was one thing, but in particular with the Ark of Covenant. If you remember, it was the Philistines that asked their elders what to do, and their elders told them to do this, and that, or priests, sorry, rather. But that was the priest of the Philistines. That wasn't the priest of Israel, right? So there, there's that. Um, but one of the things that I'd also say as we go along with this, even with that, what do we recognize Israel still not doing? They're doing what was right in their own eyes. They're not doing what God told them to do and how God told them to do things. Now, obviously, as we went through Judges, we saw times and moments whenever they did what was right, right? But we see oftentimes they are inserting their own ways throughout this process. Can you halfway do what God says? You have to fully do what God says. And is that not the point that Joshua, which is why I started off with this all the way back in Joshua, I've given you this land, right? If you're going to go in this land and conquer it. And then he gets there, uh, conquers it on at the end. Joshua, in his farewell speech, said, God will be with you if you do what? Part of what is in the law? Part of what God says? All of it. Okay? And that's the point. You still see them here doing what was right in their own eyes, even to this point. And as was pointed out last time, the ark, it is now in Israel, right? Better than it being in Philistine control, but where is it not at? It's not at Shiloh, which is where the, is there a problem with that? Okay. And it's going to stay here for 20 years. All right. So we see this continued way of going about this or on this path. Okay. We have that here leaving off in 1 Samuel 6, and that leads us over into 1 Samuel 7, which we're going to see Samuel say some things and start to get the children of God back to Obeying him, recognizing where they are and doing what they need to. But here in 6, even whenever the ark returns, you would think we just got defeated. We didn't seek God's approval for taking the ark there in the first place. It was taken. We were defeated. Now it's back. Yet they still aren't quite there, right? Seeking God, doing what God says. So as we then get into 7, okay, just kind of started with where this is at here in here, Jeff, uh, Jerem. We get there, um, it's there, but then we get into, I believe it starts in verse 3. Samuel said, makes a statement to the house of Israel. What does he say? Say that again. Get rid of the foreign God. Okay. Beginning in verse 3, going through verse 4, then Samuel spoke to the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your hearts, then put away the foreign gods and the Asherahs from among you, and prepare your hearts for the Lord, and serve him only. And he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. Okay, We'll get to verse 4 here in a minute. So what does Samuel do? Uh, Carrie said, right? You need to put away these foreign gods. Essentially, what's he saying? You need to put it away, which would mean what? What you're doing is he called out the sin. So he called out the sin, and what's the reaction that we see? Four, so the children of Israel put away the bells and the asterisks and serve the Lord only. This continues then into five through six. Samuel gathered all of Israel to Mizpah. Uh, and Samuel said, gather all of Israel to Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord for you. So they gathered together at Mizpah, drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and they fasted that day and said there, we have sinned against the Lord, and Samuel judged the children of Israel 
in this poem. One of the things I'm wanting to point out here is in this account in 1 Samuel 7, we see repentance, right? We see what needs to be done. First of all, as was pointed out, God called, or sorry, Samuel called out the heir and the issue that was there. Did that have to be done? It had to be made aware of their issue. So God called it, or sorry, Samuel called it out. But what was the reaction? Was the reaction, you're right, and then just confess that and continue to serve the Baals? What was the reaction? They got rid of them. They confessed that they sinned, and then they repented in what sense? What did they do? They got rid of them. Whenever we look at repentance and true repentance, it's not just a mere stating the fact that you might have been wrong. It's actually making that change, and we see that change take place. That's one of the things that's pointed out here, and it's important because what did Samuel say? If you back up into verse uh, 3, if you do this and serve him only, he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. They did this. They're going to serve him only, and then we're going to see as we go throughout the rest of the chapter that God delivered them from the hands of the Philistines. Why? Because they did what they were told to do and what is fully there with repentance. So we recognize this here. I want to point out another statement that Samuel makes here. And prepare your heart for the Lord. To serve the Lord, to be one who is going to be a servant of the Lord and doing the things that, that, that you should be doing, is there work and preparation and something that needs to be done? Absolutely. That's one of the things that's pointed out here. Hey, not only do you need to get rid of these things, but you need to prepare, prepare your heart to do the things of the Lord. Part of it is getting rid of what you shouldn't be doing, but then doing the things that you should be doing. And Samuel's hitting at that here whenever he's talking to the children of Israel, and it's one of the things that we see them doing. Jason? It's a very good point. You know, that departure comes from whenever the fact that the word of the Lord is not being taught, right? And that's one of the things that we've hit on throughout is that the word wasn't being taught throughout Israel like it should. Samuel here, what does he do? He teaches the word, right? That's one of the things that's being pointed out. Samuel teaches the word. And what do you have here? You have those with the right hearts, the humble hearts that accept that message and make that application. And that's really important for us understand that you have to have the right hearts to accept that message and these here did one of the other things that I want to, to point out here is this the children of Israel clearly where had they gotten at this point in time I mean they, they were wrapped up in idolatry that was one of the things that was pointed out but the moment that they were willing to humble themselves before God to confess their wrong and to repent in turn, what did God do? Accept him back, right? He forgave him. You know, you, you think about whenever one might get into a situation where they have in their head, God's never going to forgive me. You don't understand where I've been and what I've done. I think where these people have gotten to. And while it's not explicitly stated here in Samuel, we've talked about before what idolatry typically entails as far as, as far as immorality. So you would 
assume the immoral actions that would have been associated with that. Samuel says you need to put those away, including all the immoral actions that would be along with it, and you need to follow and serve God. Are you willing to do that? If you're willing to do that, you can, again, be one who is a servant of God and one who um, God forgives of those sins. Don't ever think that you are too far gone in that sense. So long as you have this day, you have that opportunity to make it right. That's why Samuel preached. Hey, we still have an opportunity here if you do these things. It doesn't mean that, you, there, there are, it doesn't mean that there aren't actions that need to be taken. That was clearly his point. You need to do this and you need to truly repent. But if you are willing to do that, God's going to be with you. He's especially in this case going to be with you against the Philistines, and we're going to see that in a moment. Eric? I think the big lesson for us is uh, you have to have a full understanding of what God wants you to do. And, and, and that requires study, and then uh, as we people here, we're not doing it because they were serving God, but they also had bells and aspects, and they were mixing it all up. That's right. You know, I believe that's why the statement in Judges really sums it up. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Well, if you're doing what was right in your own eyes, yeah, there could be times wherever you actually trip or fall into doing what God told you to do. But you're really just doing what was right in your own eyes. In other words, you're not going back to the Word and doing what God told you to do. And that's where these need to get back to. And uh, this is obviously a step in the right direction for that, right? Samuel's saying this is what you need to do. Because it's going against what God's told us to do. And they willingly gathered here at Mizpah, confessed and repented and did that. And so we're going to see that as we continue to on um, throughout this lesson. Anything else? Mm-hmm. It's, it's, it's interesting. Maybe it's just not the way it's under the sun. The world, religion wants to talk now about the God that is all love and no punishment. This, this was the problem here. They didn't want the God that had the power. The Philistines are like, oh, he just slammed our God. He's giving problems to our God. Well, what's the result of that? He's bigger than our God. But they didn't want to deal with that. They wanted what they had. They showed him some reverence because they realized they needed to do something. But they moved it away. Don't put that in front of me. That's too hard. And then it comes to Israel. They're rejoicing over what they have. And they go through this motion of offering up something they still get it wrong because they're not doing the right thing. And it's when you get to chapter 7 and Samuel reminds them what the full extent of that is, understanding God that is both. That you only get the blessing when you're obedient. You get the curse and you get a punishment for not. And they had to accept both of those things and be willing to let it stay. And this whole process was a refusal of that harsh God that they didn't want. They were making God into a God of their own choosing. And this is where we have to accept him as this is what he is. And that's the God that we serve. We don't get to make him up the way we want him. Well, that's definitely a problem that we see with the polytheistic religions that are out there and all these different you know, religions as you, you come across uh, Canaan and their, foreign, uh, sorry, and their idols and everything like that. They are making a God of however they want it to be. They're not accepting what the truth is and doing what that God tells them to do. And it's something that had an influence and an impact on Israel. And uh, it continued to be that case, as Amy said, until we get here into 7 and we see a change uh, due to the preaching of Samuel. Now, um, after this, um, they're, they're here at Mizpah. Who, who hears about this? Okay, the Philistines do. What do they do? All right, yeah, let's go get them, right? So they essentially gather up for battle, okay? And they head over here 
to where the congregation is gathering at Mizpah. Now, whenever it is there, uh, or whenever they are on the way, and, and uh, the Israelites hear about this, what happens? They react. They, they are afraid, right? They are afraid. But man, they're coming to get us. But what do they do? They ask Samuel not to cease praying for them. They ask Samuel not to cease praying for them. So they're afraid, but they have this recognition and understanding of who they're going to turn to. Now, it's different, right, than what they did the first, or whenever we back up and they went and got the ark. It was like, oh, we need to turn to God, but they did it completely in whatever way they wanted to. They went and got the ark of God, came in and got emotionally energized and tried to go out to battle, and that didn't work for him. This time, see, we'll keep praying to God. We've gone to him. We've asked for forgiveness. We've confessed our sins, and we've repented. Keep praying. He might deliver us from this situation. Is that not what Samuel said was going to happen, right? Turn to God, and his hand's going to be against the Philistines. So then what happens? God caused the thunder, and what did that do? Confused the Philistines, and then the uh, children of Israel, what do they do? They chase them, they go after them, and where does it say that chases them to? They chase them to? Yeah, Beth Carr, okay. Um, I'm not going to point that out on the map because I looked at it, and I found like one source, and I don't trust just one source. I even called Harry, and uh, he said, you know, I'm not 100% for sure either, so... We know it is a place. We know it's not going to be too far from Mizpah. But the bottom line is what they do, they, uh, they were victorious in this. Okay? Um, not only were they victorious in this, but I just, you know, just to add, add an emphasis here, clearly the point is why or how did the children of Israel win this battle? God, right? Not only the thunder, right, that caused confusion, and the children of Israel went after them. But I want you to think about something. Who came to Mizpah? The Philistines, but what of the Philistines? An army ready for battle. What were the children of Israel doing? Were they putting on their battle array, getting ready to go out to this intense battle? What were they doing? They were praying. They were confessing. They were repenting. They were there doing that. And it's in that moment, in that mode, that we see this whole thing occurring. Clearly, the point being, who was with them? God was with them. God caused this. Not only that, but then what happens from this point moving forward, at least in the days of Samuel? What is pointed out? Yeah. The hand of the Lord was against the Philistines in all the days of Samuel. Right? So the Lord was against them, and not only that, but who else did they, who did they have peace with? The Amorite. Okay? So we see the effect here, right? Certainly in a physical sense, but no doubt we see the spiritual application, turning to God, right? Doing what you should, and God is going to be with you. Um, now, some other things that are stated or said um, throughout the rest of chapter 7. Samuel, okay, after this event, what does this say he does on a, a yearly circuit? Okay, judges, and what cities does he go to? Bethel, Mizpah, Gilgal, but he would always return to his home at Ramah. Okay, the reason why I got I have Gilgal over here is because this map is very zoomed in into the area of Philistia. Um, Gilgal is over here. I believe it was just north of Jericho and Ai and all those areas just uh, would be on the west side of the Jordan River. Okay, so it's a little bit off this map, but you would have an idea of where it was. So the point being, Samuel judged in these areas, okay? Now, this leads over into chapter 8. But before I get over into that, because it kind of shifts gears a little bit, does anybody have any other comments or statements or anything to this point going through for Samuel 7? All right, so get over into 1 Samuel chapter 8. And uh, starts off talking about Samuel. And what does he do? Okay, he's older. That's one of the things that's pointed out by the elders that come to him. He's older, and what does he do? Yeah, puts his sons as judges, okay? And what do we read about his sons? How are they? They didn't walk in his ways, Larry. They could be bought. <laughs> they could be bought. 
That's a good way of putting it, right? So they don't walk in the ways of Samuel. They can be bought. They take bribes and all these other sorts of things, okay? So because of that, and I just, I typed in, and this is kind of a picture came up, so I thought it was one that could be used. The people, what do they want? They want a king, right? They come and they ask for a king. I I do want to stop here, though, real quickly. Who came and started talking to him about this? Elders. And I find that just a little bit interesting from the standpoint. Was it just the young, hip kids that wanted to be like the other nations? Who wanted to be like the other nations? Elders. Older people who are supposed to be doing what? (laughs) Right? Teaching God's word. You know, I'll stop right here and make this point. We see this. It's the elders that come, and I know these might look like younger people, but, you know, it's the elders that come and that really kind of ask for this, although it does trickle down, and we see that this is what the rest of Israel wants. So as the leadership goes, oftentimes, so is everybody else, right? As the leaders go, as the elders go, now that isn't obviously 100% true all the time because you can have an unfaithful parent and a faithful kid. Or a faithful parent and an unfaithful kid, right? But the point is, this is not just kind of, hey, the young kids come and like you would think, hey, we want to be like everyone else. We want to be more, I'm, I'm even losing the word I'm trying to think, uh, woke. That's probably not the right word. Progressive. Progressive, thank you. That's, that's a oh, more wiser, mature word than, see, I'm younger. <laughs> David? That's a, that, that's a really good point. So the fact that they see these two, uh, Samuel's two sons put in and that they can be bought and they're not walking in his ways, that in of itself is not wrong to go and say, hey, we need something different because these two aren't doing what they should be doing. They're not walking in the ways of the Lord. They're not leading us in that way. They're not judging in that way. But they go and they do, again, what is right in their own eyes. We want to be like the other nations, not let's figure out a way to either get their behavior corrected or get a righteous uh, individual in to do this. They go to this extreme of asking for a, um, a king. And again, they do point out, hey, Samuel, you're old and your sons, they don't walk in your ways, but they throw in there at the end what their real intent is, right? And we'll see why at the very end. What do they say at the end? At, at the end of that first statement there, and actually I don't even think I have it up there. Oh, no, I do. Sorry. Uh, Yeah, this is one through four. Uh, Look, you're old. Your sons do not walk in your ways. Now make us king to judge us like all the nations. Right? We're going to see why this is really, although these other two things aren't wrong in of themselves, this is really what they're after. Okay? They want to be like the other nations. They are not looking to necessarily... um, do what is right there. So Samuel, whenever he hears about this, what does he do? Yeah, praise God. And what does God tell him? They're not rejecting you. They're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. Obviously, I'm sure sir, you all have probably heard sermons on that quote or that statement rather from Samuel or at least have had it said in a sermon at some point in time making a point there. But no doubt. Whenever people are rejecting the message or rejecting the stance for God, does that mean that you, as the one standing for truth, did anything wrong? No. Who are they rejecting? They're rejecting God. And don't ever let the other thought creep into your mind that you did something wrong. It's going to cause you to shell up. It's going to cause you to keep your mouth shut, which is ultimately what they want to have happen. And let that not be the case. They're rejecting God. You continue to preach truth. So God says, hey, who they're rejecting is not you. They're rejecting me. Okay? But what does God tell Samuel to do? Larry? Okay. 
That's exactly right. So he tells them, look, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting me. We're going to give them the king. But before you do that, you go tell them all the problems they're going to have by bringing in someone else to be king, right? Or to, by, by bringing in the king, a king. And what are those problems? He said he's going to make his sons part of the military. <coughs> That's right. And you said it at the end there, really kind of summing it all up, right? Doing all these things, and I put the, the whole text up there of what Samuel told him, 7 through 9. But really, you get all the way through this, um, uh, sorry, 7 through 18. Really, you get all the way through this, and um, what do we see? He will take a tenth of your sheep, and you will be his servants. That's really the point, right? He's going to take your sons, your daughters. He's going to take your servants. He's going to take the best of what you have. He's going to tax you. He's going to do this. He's going to do this all for his service. Okay? Essentially, you're going to end up being his servants. But not only that, what does God tell them up front? Through Samuel, what does God tell them? You're going to cry out just like you did in the past. You're going to cry out that day. That's right. So all this is going to happen. You are going to be his servants. It's not like you're going to have this king that's going to serve you, which, you know, if you really think about the way things should work, should be the leader serving the people, right? That's what we read throughout Scripture. But he's saying that's not what it's going to be like. You guys are going to have somebody that serves you as your leader and does things that benefit you. He's going to do things that benefit himself. And so you are going to be his servant. And whenever you cry out to the Lord because of this, he isn't going to hear you. So Samuel lays all this out by the word of God, yet what is the response of the people? We still want a king. I know what you just said, but we want to be like the other nations. We still want a king. So Samuel takes us back to God, um, and, uh, and, and then obviously we're going to get into chapter 9, and we're going to see that process of a king being anointed. You know, it's real interesting to me what, what we see here. And I know one was certainly talking about um, you're sinning and you need to make a change. But both of them are a message from God, right? You're sinning and you need to make a change in chapter 7. And what did they do? Uh, the humble hearts to hear the message, to repent, confess, do the things that they need to do to be right with God. Here, Samuel's giving them a message from God. This is God telling them, hey, Samuel, you tell them what it's going to be like, and here's what it's going to be like. And yet, what are the people's reaction to that? You cannot pick and choose when you want to listen to God. You cannot pick and choose what's going, what you think is right for you in that moment of situation. Ah, you know, I'm going to listen to God here, but not here. If God gives a message, we have to be humble, we have to heed it, and we have to make the application to our life. Obviously, the right reaction here would have been what? Oh, yeah, you know, we did want one, but, uh, yeah, no, 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 we don't want one now. We understand the problems that's going to come of that. This is what God is saying. So we're not going to do that. We recognize this and we realize this, and it goes back to the point that I was somewhat making earlier. Guys, it really all comes down to the hearer of that message. Are you willing to hear the message of the Lord properly with a humble, prepared heart to do the will of the Lord and to hear his warnings and what he says, or are you not? And if you are and you submit and obey him, doesn't mean that you're not going to have any issues in your life. That was pointed, uh, actually, I think Harry said he might be pointing that out in this next sermon, but that's pointed throughout scripture. It doesn't mean that you're not going to have problems, but you're going to live a life of hope, knowing that you are doing what is right before God, and you have hope of eternal life. But if you don't, then you're not going to live that life. So we recognize that here. David? Mm. You know, they, they want to fight. They hear us to fight. And, you know, they get, they get, we can't get somebody else to fight our battles for us. That's right. We have, to be, we have to be workers in the vineyard of the Lord. And out is a soldier in Christ fighting those battles. You know, you know that, that, that's exactly right and a really good point. You know what else is interesting about that is we want a king that's going to go out and fight our battles for us, but yet who's a king going to get to fight the battles? You. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean... You know, we think that it's going to work out like that. And obviously the point of all this is they needed to stop and recognize that they had a king. 
And that king was God. And not only was it God, it was the God, the one and only God, the one that created everything and was in control of all things. And they failed to recognize that. We need to be those who don't let ourselves get to that point. And as we talked about throughout this class, um, you know, one of the ways in which we do that is we need to make sure that we're constantly teaching all the Lord, the work of the Lord, and uh, talking about those things. So that mindset doesn't depart from us because it's going to be easy to always see what so-and-so has over here. It's a little bit better, a little bit better lifestyle, a little bit better thing, and we want to be more like the world. That's not at all what we need to be like. We need to be those who are the children of God and serve him and serve him only. Anything else on that? Yes, ma'am. You know, certainly it's one of those things that, that we need to keep in mind is uh, we need to do everything we can to raise godly children, but ultimately at the end of the day, whose choice is it? It's the child's choice. It's the individual's choice whether they're going to be those who serve the Lord or not, and that's something that we all need to take and make application of. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, we are next class going to be going through uh, Lesson 19 to so make sure that everybody is prepared for that.